As I pondered for the past seven months, what would, what, would I, what would we call a talk like this? Why am I even doing this? The thought kept coming into my mind, I would like my grandchildren and their children to know what grandpa believes. And that was the motivating force that kept pushing me to read another book and search out another name or date. I want my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to know that I love America and that we have some beautiful principles of freedom that have been lost and that they need to be restored. And so with all my heart and soul this evening, I'm going to try and explain my feelings for ourselves and our posterity. Now we're going to start back with uh, one, of my, one of my forefathers. Several of the people in this audience trace back to this great pioneer, the pioneer Parley Pratt played a significant role in the founding of the area in which we live. I'm going to start with a story, July the 4th, 1839. Now, he had been in jail for eight months and four days as part of a religious persecution in the area where he lived. It was a miserable condition. This is uh, very much like the jail would have looked. A two-story building at night, he slept in the dungeon down the basement. In the daytime, they were allowed on the second floor. Can you see the tiny little window off to the right? Can you imagine what it would be like to spend the day on July the 4th in the attic? That was the living condition. In the attic, temperature probably 110 degrees. And so day after day, week after week, he was arrested when it was in the middle of the winter. So on July the 4th, 1839, a hot, miserable, sultry summer day, he gets out his heavy winter coat and his heavy fur cap and he puts them on. He says, I was planning to break jail, and if I was successful, I didn't want to leave my coat and hat behind. <laughs> Meanwhile, he hears the steps of the jailer coming up the, up the stairway. It's evening time now. The 4th of July, he describes in great detail in his autobiography. There were people all over town. Bands were playing. Firecrackers were going off. The soldiers with their weapons were parading back and forth on their horses. Lots and lots of military power. And now he's going to break jail. The plan was this, when the jailer got to the door and opened it to pass through the coffee pot for the inmates, he was going to grab the door and yank it open and run for it. And I wasn't alone, there were a total of three of them that were going to try and do this. It was a half a mile, a half a mile of open fields before they would get to the trees where his brother was waiting with the horses. Okay, he hears the steps of the jailer, he puts on his heavy winter coat, he gets on his fur hat. He's all ready. They grab a hold of the doorknob. The jailer starts opening the door to pass the coffee pot through. He yanks it open and the three men push the jailer aside and head down the stairs. And immediately the wife of the jailer starts shrieking out, Jailbreak! Jailbreak! Oh, the whole town now is coming toward them. He says, I ran like a deer, leaping some fences, crashing through others. In his, long, in his heavy winter coat on the 4th of July, he reaches the horses. He leaps onto the horse his brother's holding for him. His brother says, run, run, they're upon you. He wheels his horse around, and just as he's ready to gallop away, a brand new Kentucky rifle is placed to his head, and the man pulls the trigger. Now, that's as far as we can go on the sport. We don't have time to tell the whole story. <laughs> Suffice it to say, he lived long enough to write his autobiography. <laughs> Parley Pratt. Oh, I missed the important part. While he was in the jail, he ripped the back of his shirt out, borrowed some red cloth from the jailer, and he made an American eagle. Now imagine how crude it may have looked. He made an American eagle and the block letters, the word liberty. They hung that out the window and sang boldly a song that he wrote about their planned jailbreak. <laughs> so this evening, as you leave, we're going to give you a, a little Parley P. Pratt Liberty flag. It's, it's a little bookmark and we'll have this liberty flag on one side as a memory of our evening's discussion. Now let's go back a little earlier in time. We're going to look at the Reverend John Lathrop for just a moment. Several people in this congregation trace their heritage back to John Lathrop, myself being one of them. There were great courageous people in the old days, our forebearers. Now I'm going to call them forebearers because in a moment we're going to have a foremother and it gets a little annoying saying forefathers and foremothers. So we're going to have forebearers tonight. 
So we have John Lathrop. He was persecuted in England for his religious beliefs. He was imprisoned, treated brutally. He finally fled to America, exiled. Actually, they wanted to catch him and, and execute him, but they missed him in the last chance there. He got on a boat, he fled to America, and here we have representative pictures of that, uh, that time, uh, the Mayflower and the uh, people represented these separatists that fled to America. John Lathrop being one of the great noble ones of that time. Now another forebearer was Anne Hutchinson. She was a noble woman, a great and courageous lady. When the ministers in the community started teaching certain doctrines, if she disagreed, she told them. And the minister says, I'm saying plural, ministers, there were 40 of them that finally called her to task. 40 ministers finally brought her into trial. She had broken no law except she had offended 40 ministers. She started inviting ladies to her home and after church they would get together in her room, in her front room, and they would talk about the sermon. You can just imagine the conversation going on there. <laughs> She would give her opinion openly. She became, she became a respected person among her followers, but not with the ministers. She was getting a bigger attendance that they, than they were at church. Anne Hutchison was eventually exiled, went out onto the frontier, Long Island, New York, and in, in that area they built a log cabin. I never mentioned she had 15 children. They built a log cabin, her husband died, and not long after that the Indians burned the cabin down and they killed every child but one. Eight-year-old Suzanne was taken captive. And that's my great-great-grandmother. Eight-year-old Suzanne was held by the Indians for four years. A Dutch trader came along and traded for her, set her free, and she could then raise a great and noble posterity. I am proud of our illustrious progenitors. What great and noble heritage we have. These people were starting to discover, they hadn't quite discovered freedom of religion yet, but they were starting to discover the importance of liberty and literacy. Liberty and literacy go hand in hand. You can't have a free people that are ignorant. You've got to be able to read. So they said, we're going to have a law, and they passed it. It was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. And in that law they wrote, it being one chief project of the old deluder, Satan, to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures, it is therefore ordered that every township in this jurisdiction, after the Lord hath increased them to the number of fifty householders, shall then forthwith appoint one within their town to teach all such children as shall resort to him to write and read. Now why did they want them to learn to write and read? So they could read the scriptures. So Satan couldn't delude them. It's pretty exciting. This went on for the next two or three hundred years as our great noble forebears kept encouraging the reading of the scriptures. They kept encouraging literacy. And so I just give a brief example a couple of hundred years later, at least 150 or so years later. In 1787, the same Congress that ratified the Constitution they were the ones that also encouraged religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. Schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. We want the schools to teach religion, morality, and knowledge. Which religion? Now this religion, morality, and knowledge became the anchor it was the anchor. It didn't become. It was the anchor of the American culture from 1620 to about 1936. Something happened after that. Let's go back and see what religion. Samuel Adams, one of our most trusted and beloved founders, he says this is the religion of America, the religion I'm about to define for you. Benjamin Franklin said these are the fundamentals of all sound religion. Now, if we got everybody in here to write a little piece of paper down with their beliefs, their fundamental beliefs, you would then get all these papers together and run them through a computer, of course, and sort them all out. You would discover five things that we have in common, at least that many. There exists a creator who made all things, and mankind should recognize and worship him. The creator has revealed a moral code of behavior for happy living, 
which distinguishes right from wrong. The Creator holds mankind responsible for the way they treat each other. All mankind live beyond this life. In the next life, individuals are judged for their conduct in this one. These are considered the five fundamentals of sound religion, the religion of all mankind. If you examine non-Christian religions, you'll find many of them believe the same fundamentals. This is the religion that they wanted taught in our schools. And for a long time, clear until McGuffey Reader, after this, this is where the change started taking place, it was not until the demise of McGuffey Readers that religion and morality were abandoned in our schools to be replaced by a content of trivia and amusement. Now, I don't have time to give that explanation this evening, but I would call your attention if you're one of the first ones to the city building and you'll get this tape called, Which Father Are You Following? I explain that in great detail. That's why that's the talk I would like to give, but time doesn't allow it. Okay, McGuffey Reader. There are a few of you in this room who remember McGuffey Reader. My dad is one of them. When he was a little boy attending one room schoolhouse, they were using McGuffey Reader. It's thrilling to read. I enjoy reading McGuffey just because it's enjoyable. Second grade reader is my level. Now, I'm not joking. The sixth grade McGuffey is like college level reading. It's way beyond anything in a, in a grade school. So second grade reader, you should read it. The story of Henry the Boot Black. You'll be inspired by Henry the Boot Black, as you will all of the other stories in McGuffey. Every story McGuffey uses to teach religion, morality, and knowledge. You teach reading, writing, punctuation, spelling, and the moral values of Jesus Christ. The enemies of God are attacking the core foundations of this land. Now this is a thought-provoking statement. This is a statement by a highly respected clergyman named Joseph Worthlin. The enemies of God are attacking the core foundations of this land. He goes on to say that the only power strong enough to withstand a fullness of iniquity is with the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we look over our nation and we see the kinds of laws and the kinds of promoted uh, evil that is going forth or coming forth, we start to realize that we're observing all of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah in, a, in America today. They're available. A fullness of evil can only be withstood with a fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if there's truly an attack, then this information may be helpful. In any struggle, it is essential to know two things. What we are fighting for and what we are fighting against. Now, many of us know what we're for. But if Satan is powerful enough to be secret, he may not know well enough what we're fighting against to recognize it. So we'll try and show you some of that here this evening. We're going to use this as the theme of the rest of our talk. All things have their opposites, or there is opposition in all things. Virtue and vice, pleasure and pain, liberty and liberté. What are we talking about here? In 1789, our founding fathers, and mothers too, had established a great free nation under God. In France, and we're just picking a place to show you an example of opposites. All things have their opposites. That means if a great free nation under God is being born, then we should be able to find an example of a nation being destroyed. And France is a good example. If you can't see it from that distance, that's a guillotine invented during this time period. And historians call this period of time, beginning in 1789, the Reign of Terror. In 1789, God raised up men to establish a nation under God. They were raised up. This wasn't happenstance, not just good people getting together. They came together because their Heavenly Father wanted them there. He inspired and directed the movement. Meanwhile, if that has an opposite, then in France, the minions of Satan established the reign of terror. And that's easily documented. There's mountains of evidence to show this was an established evil activity. Sometimes when I read this, I keep thinking, I've got to stop and say every now and then, which father are we following? 
Now, we've all heard of the father of our nation, but who's ever heard of Adam Weishaupt? I don't need, you don't need to raise your hands, but I promise you not five people in this room have ever heard his name before. And I probably, they're the five that I told about it just before the meeting started. Adam Weishaupt? Well, George Washington, we know what he's for. He's the one that says, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's George Washington. Adam Weishaupt, he taught, destroy the Christian religion, overthrow the existing government, and rule the world with the great society. Now that's a, a little encapsulation of Weishaupt's writings. When did he start his organization officially? Notice all things have their opposites. When did the United States start? What was the foundation document of the United States? Declaration of Independence, July the 4th, 1776. Here we have May the 1st, 1776. He beat him by a month or so. Old Satan working with his minion, Weishaupt, he starts creating this evil plan. And they called it at that time the Order of the Illuminati. They felt they were illuminated. Now this strange circumstance was that one of their minions, now a minion is the opposite of a missionary. <laughs> a minion is, is this evil individual that's trying to do evil. Okay? One of their minions was struck by lightning and killed. Don't know, you know from what cause other than just, you know, he, okay, he's laying there on the road. Somebody comes up, they're, they're rifling through his materials and they find this, these papers that prove a traitor and a conspirator. <laughs> And they show it to the elector of Bavaria. This is all happening in Bavaria. By the way, I didn't mention that Adam Weishaupt was a, a religion professor at Ingolstadt University. <laughs> okay, this is the evil Weishaupt. He's a religion teacher. Okay, so they rifle through this guy's materials. They find he's a, a traitor. They give it to the elector of Bavaria and the elector outlaws. The Illuminati. Evil organization. We don't want that here anymore. So what do they do? Do they repent? No, they changed the name. Now, one change after the other. These are the names of the Illuminati as, as the years go by. In, in France in 1789, the evil empire was being directed by the Jacobin Club. The Tugendbund in Germany. The Sublime Perfect Masters. The Society of the Just. Now, notice we're up now to 1848. The League of the Just. This is the genealogy of communism. This is the sequence. Adam Weishaupt was the great-grandfather of this movement. Bavarian Illuminism is what it's called in the history books. And then 1848, we start out here with what history many of you know about it from here on. You know about Karl Marx and what he wrote and did. George Washington, we've mentioned his great founding principles. Establish a Christian nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Adam Weishaupt sent his minions to America. During the rule, reign of, you know, during the leadership of our founding fathers, they were invited to join this other evil organization. And George Washington spoke out against it strongly and condemned the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati. It got no foothold in America. Now, the Statue of Liberty. That's what we always call this lady. But in my reading, I found that that's not the correct name. She's called... Liberty Enlightening the World. That's the, that's the official title of this Statue of Liberty. Liberty Enlightening the World. And I loved it. All things have their opposites. The Illuminati is going to illuminate. And the Statue of Liberty is going to enlighten. And they're both opposite. I picked two noble ladies as symbols. The statue was not given to America until 1884. We got it set up in 1886. Bartholdi, Frederick Bartholdi, was the French artist that created this beautiful image. And the French people gave it to America a hundred years after the Reign of Terror. They gave it to America to show their respect for our joining together during the Revolution and successfully beating England. In 1903, on the base of the statue, the poem of Emma Lazarus was, was added. This is this beautiful poem. It includes some of these words. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless tempest-tossed to me. 
I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This is the beautiful poetry that describes America from its founding until 1903. A golden door, a land of opportunity. Send them the homeless tempest talk. I want to sing, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Send them to me. Now, this is a sad picture. I want to decide slightly for a moment, not so that this, this, it is a very sad picture. We have here Queen Marie Antoinette. She is before the tribunal. They have just sentenced her to die at the guillotine. Compare the feeling of the statue, uh, liberty enlightening the world. Compare the feeling you see when you, or you feel when you see the Statue of Liberty and you think of the grief. If, if you were able to look at the original on this, I have the original. It's a beautiful wood engraving imprinted into an old, old history book. When I used to travel a lot, I loved to go to used bookstores and I went into a used bookstore and I sat down on the floor and I read all afternoon waiting to give my evening lecture. Here I sat in the classroom and read. One of the books I read was The French Revolution of 1789 by John Abbott. On and on I read. It was intriguing. But in the front was this beautiful frontispiece. Now part of the picture is not showing. This is done by engraving on a block of wood on end grain. You engrave this image with tiny little snips of wood. Every white space on there, the tiny the seams, the seams and the threads are all engraved in a block of wood. That's an aside from the lecture tonight. But I want you to know this is master artist work as you see these beautiful engravings from the old days. Not quite in the view, but on the right-hand side, sitting in the gallery watching. On the original, you can see the grief in her face. You can see the anger and the ignorance in the soldiers. And over on the side is a woman weeping, and you can see the tears coming down her cheeks in this old wood engraving. Well, Queen Marie Antoinette, send them to the guillotine instead of send me your tired, your poor. Liberté, they said, not liberty. And we'll describe that here in just a moment. Liberty. And the man that discussed this with me is here tonight. I was visiting with one of my friends and I said, what's the definition of liberty? Isn't that freedom from restraint? Oh, he says there's a better definition than that. Liberty is freedom to choose the right. Well, now, if that's all you can choose, then you don't have liberty, do you? Reason this through for a moment. Let's say that we have the liberty... Freedom from restraint, and we choose to do something wrong. What will happen to me then? Let's say I decide to steal. Will I still have my liberty? Not for very long. So liberty is the freedom to choose the right. It's liberty under law. The laws of God. The moral and religious foundation of a free people is liberty under the laws of God. In France, they were trying to practice another form of liberty, and that was liberty without restraint. Let's liken two men. We're going to take all things have their opposites. We looked at two great women. Let's look at two men. Okay, this is uh, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson's criticized, and some have said, oh, he wasn't even a Christian. Others have said, oh, Jefferson, why, he had his own Bible. Our Bible wasn't good enough for him. He had a study guide that he created when, when he was alive that he did just for his own personal study. Have you ever made a scrapbook? Sure, you know, some of it, you know, everybody made a scrapbook. You've cut out and pasted things in that you felt were worthy of saving. So Jefferson bought four Bibles, English, French, Latin, and Greek. Then he carefully cut out the words of Jesus in each of these languages he bought a book bound in leather with plain blank pages and he carefully pasted in the four different languages so that he could study all of the words of Jesus in four languages. How many of you have gone to that much trouble to try and study the words of our Savior? Okay, reflect on this. Jefferson was a serious student of the teachings of Jesus Christ. He loved Jesus Christ. By the way, the page on the right-hand side is the actual photograph of the page. That's Jefferson's handwriting of the title page. And his book was called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth, extracted textually from the Gospels in Greek, Latin, French, and English. To the corruptions of Christianity, I am indeed opposed, but not to the genuine precepts of Jesus himself. 
Jefferson called the precepts of Jesus the most sublime and benevolent code of morals which has ever been offered to man. All things have their opposites. This is Voltaire. He was the hero of France during the reign of terror. He had been dead for 13 years, and they decided it was essential to dig up his remains and take them to a more prestigious cemetery. That's what the picture is. Twelve white horses with a, a driver by each horse, all polished harnesses, bands are playing, people by the tens of thousands are cheering as the remains of Voltaire are taken down the street to the new cemetery. This is a relatively well-known scene, see it in different, this is another wood engraving, beautiful art form. Who was Voltaire? He was a writer. He was one of the foremost popular writers of his day. He was trained in the law and then became a writer. What did he write? The venomous spirit with which Voltaire pursued the religion of Christ is fully expressed by his motto, he ended all of his correspondence with this motto, let us crush the wretch, crush the wretch, referring to our Savior. Now we're showing all things have their opposites. The genius of Voltaire induced France to attempt to establish liberty without religion. Which father did our pioneer forebears follow when they came west? We live in this beautiful town, in, the, in this beautiful mountain valley. We have these wonderful pioneer forefathers. We've named uh, some already. We'll name some more. Which father did they follow? Adam Weishaupt's teachings or George Washington's? If we were to clarify the Weishaupt teachings today and use modern language, we would simply say that engul is engulfed in socialism. The socialism is based upon amorality. That means the lack of moral values. That means we haven't been revealed a moral code. We don't know what's right and wrong. What may be right today may be wrong tomorrow, and just the reverse could be true. Consider marriage, for example. That's an amoral society. Evolution. Now, I liked it best when the old Black Panther, I used to travel with Eldridge Cleaver lecturing. He's dead now. Some of you may remember him. He was a Black Panther, shot it out with the Oakland Police Department. Then he fled. He said, I'm going to get out of this ratty spot, America. I don't want to see this country ever again. And he said, I'm going where I can be treated right, where I have some rights. And, and so he went to Cuba. <laughs> he spent nine months in Cuba. He said they treated him great because he was a hero, because he tried to kill American police. He was treated really great. He said, I got all the rum I could drink and all the cigars I could smoke and a driver to take me anywhere I wanted to go in a Jeep all day long. Pretty exciting, huh? Nine months of that, and he said, I'd had enough. I found out that Cuba wasn't the heaven utopia that I'd been told it was. So he went to one communist country after the other and tried them all. He finally wound up in France. And in France, he was treated again royally. He's a communist. We love him here. And he was given all the red carpet treatment, literally speaking. I said, what did you do for a living, Eldridge? Well, he says, I falsified passports. <laughs> you know, a guy's got to make a living somehow. <laughs> One day, he had a dream. And people, I've heard this over and over. I love the guy. We traveled together. And I heard it over and over, and I felt what he was saying. I felt it. He says, I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw a shaft of light coming down into a prison cell. And then it went out the other side. He said, I knew I had to go home. And go to jail. If I wanted to make my life start over again. So he called the FBI in France. He says, I'm turning myself in. I want to go back to the United States and go to prison. They thought he was crazy. He had it made in France. He finally convinced the FBI. They finally picked him up at the airport in France, went down and joined, joined with him. They got on the airline. They flew back. And just before they got off, he says, then they said to me, you better put these handcuffs on so it looks like you're under arrest. So he put the handcuffs on and he came out the airplane, you know. He gets down. There's news reporters everywhere holding the microphone in his face. 
And he says, I'd rather be in jail in America than free in any of those countries. And he came back and went to jail until he served his time. Well, that was a great guy to travel with. He was the one that taught me about evolution. He says, do you know what I was taught in school? He says, I was taught that there were molecules swimming around in the universe. Two of them struck together and fell into a tepid primeval sea. After eons of infinite time, a lizard crawled out. And that was my great-grandfather. <laughs> that's, that's no joke. That's what he told me. And since then, it's in, it's in these other lectures here. You'll see the local Utah school books teaching the same story. Joseph Smith is one of the forebears that played a significant role in the settling of our area. A significant role. He attended lectures on socialism conducted by a Mr. Finch from England. Then wrote into his journal, after he'd explained what had happened, he wrote the bottom line, I do not believe the doctrine. He also had a great deal to say about what he felt about our constitutional system of government established by the founding fathers. I am the greatest advocate of the Constitution of the United States there is on earth. The Constitution is a glorious standard. It is founded in the wisdom of God. It is a heavenly banner. Which father are we following? Each of these pioneer forefathers gives us a statement and we can decide what they were following. Here's another one. I only pick men with beards. As long as the principles of constitutional liberty shall be maintained upon this land, blessings will attend the nation. We trace the hand of the Almighty in framing the constitution of our land and believe that the Lord raised up man purposely for the accomplishment of this object, raised them up and inspired them to frame the constitution of the United States. I counsel you, I urge you, I plead with you, never so far as you have voice or influence permit any departure from the principles of government on which this nation was founded or any disregard of the freedoms which, by the inspiration of God our Father, were written into the Constitution of the United States. I am saying to you that to me the Constitution of the United States of America is just as much from my Heavenly Father as the Ten Commandments. Do we need it any clearer? Which father did our pioneer forefathers follow? Which father are we following? There is opposition in all things. This is a stained glass window, a beautiful representation of an artist as they try to create the image of God the Father and the Son Jesus Christ revealing their plan for happiness. That's what this represents. This is another stained glass window. All things have their opposites. This stained glass window is much more detailed and it'll take a little explanation. The world's plan for happiness. Now this is a line drawing of that same window. I might add that I gave this lesson down in Texas one time and three months later I got two beautiful colored transparencies in the mail. This is the photograph of one of those transparencies. And the person said, I heard your lecture in Dallas, and I really questioned some of the things you said. I really wondered if that window was in England where you said it was. And so I called my friend in England and sent them over to Butrus Webb's home. And they took this photograph for you. <laughs> and so I always liked that. And he was very kind, and he said, signed, Dr. McDonald, State School Board of Education. Notice the slogan at the top of this stained glass window. Now remember, this is the plan of the world. This is the plan of the evil one. This is Weishaupt and all of his minions as they're working together to structure a society that they believe to be the utopian society. Remold it nearer to the heart's desire. Now two or three people this evening came up to me and said, you're the blacksmith, aren't you? Well, yes, I am a blacksmith. 
We do have three forges, and we enjoy beating hot iron. <laughs> On the right, we see two men with big hammers. We see the world being held on an anvil, and we see them forging or shaping the world to whose heart's desire? Theirs. Remold it nearer to the heart's desire. What's the, oh, by the way, that's George Bernard Shaw and Edward Pease. These are two of the characters up there. George Bernard Shaw, the playwright. Uh, on the left, we see a man pulling on a rope. What do you suppose he's doing? He's pumping the air for the billows. Now, we reconstructed this at Cove Fort. I had the privilege of assembling the blacksmith shop, putting the billows in, putting a rope on it, getting every kid that comes by to pull the rope. He's doing it himself here. Now notice in their little emblem in the middle, it says, pray devoutly, hammer stoutly. These are the slogans of this social movement. There's these do-gooders that decided they're going to share their blessings with the world, and I'll show you how they're going to do it in a moment. What are they doing down on the bottom? They're praying devoutly. Well, what are they praying to? Our Heavenly Father? No. They're praying at an altar of socialist literature. This is an altar of books. Plays one pleasant, plays two unpleasant. These are some of George Bernard Shaw's works. Down at the bottom, we have Fabian tracks and essays. Now, in the track, and by the way, notice this gentleman off to the left. This window is an accurate window. He's thumbing his nose at the whole thing. I want nothing to do with it, he's saying, symbolically here in the window. H.G. Wells. He was trying to say, and they represented him. He didn't want that system, and he did it. They thumbed it. Anyway, he's there, thumbing his nose. Fabian tracks and essays. The major principles that I found, I found personally, okay? I got out the Fabian tracks. I did enjoy this research. Here they are. Government ownership or control of all land. Now, that's what they're going to, these are the principles I found in the Fabian literature. Government ownership or control of the major industries. Government control over labor. Government ownership or control of communications and transportation. Government control of all credit. Each one of these is worth at least an hour. At least an hour, even a college semester class on each of these subjects. Take any one of them up there. The control of the land. How much land does the government own in Utah? Yeah, somewhere up around 70%. Uh, government control of labor. How about this one down here? Credit. There's a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island. I commend it to you. It's very interesting reading. It's a research report, good, credible research. Jekyll Island was the place where a secret society met in 1913 to decide the future. No, I think they met in 1908. To decide the future of our banking system, our credit system. I think it was Jekyll Island. I read the title and I thought it was a mystery about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I thought, oh, I better read that. <laughs> That's how I got into it. Government control of insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, Workman's Comp, Social Security, a long list of insurance. Government control of education, <laughs> elimination of the significance of the family, elimination of the significance of religion, establishment of the minimum wage, a universal system of pensions, justified use of force if necessary to attain these socialistic goals. Now the next one's the only one that I did not find in the Fabian Tracks and Essays. It's in Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, A Graduated Income Tax. Now these are the summary of the doctrines of socialism that were taught to our forebearer, Joseph Smith, to which he said, I do not believe the doctrine. And others, uh, long, many long list of people who have refuted it. I want to suggest to you that some of our friends and neighbors don't understand that this is socialism. One of our, our forebears, his name was Marion Romney, a very prominent and loved, respected person. He said the principles of socialism are like the tentacles of an octopus. To the degree that we let ourselves be entwined in them, to that degree we will cut ourselves off from the spirit of the Lord. The tentacles of socialism crush the life out of a free society. They are part of what Marion Romney called the plan of the evil one. All things have their opposites. The Al Smith test, this is the, the opposites I want to show you right here. 
If any of you remember Al Smith, he was a great Democrat. He was the governor of the state of New York and served faithfully. He loved America. And in 1928, he ran for president against Herbert Hoover. Al Smith lost. In 1932, he helped Franklin Roosevelt run for president. He campaigned for him. Al Smith was a devoted, loving American. In 1936, after watching what went on for four years in the Roosevelt administration, Al Smith gave a talk to the Democrats to try and explain what had happened. He said that a foreign power had taken over their party. And he went on in great detail. You can read this speech by probably look it up on the internet. The Betrayal of the Democratic Party by Alfred E. Smith is the name of it. And in his talk, he gives the comparison of the Socialist Party platform, the same principles that we have here on the left, he compares them to the Democratic Party platform. The Democratic Party platform of 1928 and 1932 reads like something that Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson would have written. It was a beautiful statement of American belief, a beautiful statement of constitutional government and values, moral and religious values. In 1936, he explained that that was no longer the case, and then he did the Al Smith test. He says to his audience, take the Democratic Party platform and lay it down on the table. Take the Socialist Party platform and lay it right beside it on the table. Then take a big black pencil and mark out the name Socialist and mark out the name Democratic. Just look at what they, what they offer. He says, then evaluate the present administration and ask yourself, which, which platform most nearly follows what the administration is doing? And then he says these powerful words, pick up the platform that most closely shows what's going on and you would not dare touch the, the Democratic Party platform. Now, if we apply that same platform today, or the same, the same Al Smith test today, and we take the principles of socialism and the United States Constitution and we ask ourselves the same question. We look at the principles on the left and we consider the principles on the right contained in our great founding document. And then we look at the current administration. I'm not talking about Republicans, by the way. I'm talking about the Republicans and the Democrats, our current administration, those who run the country. And ask yourself the question, which set of principles most nearly fits what's going on today. You would not place your hand on the United States Constitution. There's another test. I call it the Sanders Index, the Bernie Sanders Index. Bernie Sanders is the only member of the House of Representatives, bless his heart, that admits he's a socialist. He ran as a socialist, he won the election as a socialist, and he's the only representative from the state of Vermont. I am a socialist, he says. Bernie Sanders on the Constitutional Index, it's a method of scoring members of the House and Senate by saying, did they follow the Constitution or did they not? Bernie Sanders got a 47% positive, that's how many, you know, he got 47% right on 30 recent issues. Now, you know, we'd say that's not very good, but considering he's a socialist, I think he did really well. <laughs> The three members of the House of Representatives from Utah did not score as high as Bernie Sanders. Okay, that's enough said. You can do the homework yourself, and you'll find in the, in the talk I would like to give. There's a man named Norman Thomas at this time period. Norman Thomas was the Socialist Party candidate for president for 20 years, at least. He was the leader of the Socialist Party. He ran against every, you know, every president, Democratic and Republican for at least 20 years. Finally, after Eisenhower had been in office for some period of time, and I probably should just, just read it here, Norman Thomas was jubilant. And he says, I don't have to run for president anymore. The Democrats and Republicans are doing everything I ever hoped for. He says, the difference between Democrats and Republicans is Democrats have accepted some ideas of socialism cheerfully, while Republicans have accepted them reluctantly. Norman Thomas. 
Now we're zooming in on this stained glass window. All things have their opposites. We have the window re revealing the truths from God. We have this window revealing the truths from the other side. If we zoom in right on the center, you'll see their coat of arms. Study that for a moment and tell me what you think this is. That's it. This is the coat of arms that shows how they plan to control the world, how they plan to destroy the religion of Christ, overthrow the existing governments, and replace them with their utopian society. One of the examples of how they do this came up just a few years ago during the period when Ronald Reagan was president and the, you heard the word that the Cold War was over. You heard communism is dead, the Cold War is over. I heard that, you know, it was all on the news. So just remember, remember when the Bavarian Illuminists started changing the names? The Bavarian Illuminists said, we better change the name because that's you know, obviously not the best name now. It's, uh, so these communists got together in East Germany and they immediately, they were the first ones. Man, they hurried. It says in the newspaper, they gathered together quickly. Okay, they got together and they rechanged the name. We need some politically acceptable name. We need a, a politically correct and socially acceptable. And so they said, we'll call ourselves the Party of Democratic Socialism. One after another, these communist parties in the Soviet bloc that was supposed to have uh, fallen named themselves over. All of them named themselves something with democracy or socialism or a combination of both. The Party of Democratic Change, the Socialist Party, the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, the Agrarian Democratic Party, the Democratic Party. And the Soviet KGB felt it was no longer acceptable since they were a rather murderous group and they called themselves the Security Service. Now this is the wolf in a sheepskin as an example. Here's another one that's been very thought-provoking to me. Fifty years ago, one of our forebears, a very prominent forebear named David McKay, urged a group of professors to do the research and write the story of communism so that the common people could read a book and, and know what had happened. These professors met together several times. Finally, the burden of responsibility was placed on W. Cleone Skousen. He completed what he thought was the finished book, presented it to Mr. McKay, and Mr. McKay said, it's not complete, add some more. So he added two more chapters. Then it was presented, and this great forebear urged everyone within his range of listening to read the book. Now, is this obsolete? Since communism's dead, why would we want to read it today? Oh, we wouldn't, except that when I got it out last week, I found it more intriguing than when I read it 20 years ago. Here's the reason why. Like a wolf in a sheepskin, one at a time, the 45 goals of communism have been systematically accomplished. They're all listed in the book. 45 years ago, they were goals. And now they're no longer, well, some of them are still goals, but the, all of the significant ones have been accomplished. You can check that out at the local library in Mount Pleasant. What should we do? The enemies of God are attacking the core foundation of our land. Our Heavenly Father has revealed the plan for happiness. All things have their opposites. Satan is attempting to disturb and destroy, crush the Christian religion, overthrow the existing government, and replace it with man's government. That's what's going on. What should we do? What's this symbol? That's the open Bible. Become a specific Christian. Deny all ungodliness. Here's what we mean by a specific Christian. Satan has a line of perversion that goes like this. All we need to do is keep the commandments. You've all heard that before. Live righteously. Do what's right. You know, these general statements are not specific. And so we can make a general statement and still continue violating the laws of God. I attended, I did a lecture series in, in Texas a few years ago, and after the lecture, there were two gentlemen in gray flannel suits on the front row, and they invited me to go to their school, Accelerated Christian Education Academy. It was a wonderful experience. I spent several hours there. They assigned a young lady about your age to be my tour guide. And... At some point during this 
guide through this beautiful school. By the way, the school had 70 students in the classroom, a classroom with 70 students and one teacher. It was the state of the art, best quality of education I have ever seen in action. It was phenomenal. And I learned that they had 5,000 plus schools in more than 108 foreign lands. Big time private education and doing a splendid job teaching religion, morality, and knowledge. And I asked this young lady, what's your objective? Why are, you know, what are you planning to do? And she, she stood up just a little bit taller and she said, I'm planning to be a missionary for the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I was, I was, <laughs> I felt something when she did that. She wasn't of my religion. I don't know what religion they were even. Just beautiful Christian people trying to prepare to combat Satan. And they taught them the proper role of government in that school. They taught them the constitutional principles, the moral and religious basis of a free society. And they taught them that the open Bible ought to be their symbol. On their necktie, which is a rather beautiful necktie, they have the open Bible, the American Eagle, and the American flag. And they emphasize this Bible is an open Bible because we believe in the specific teachings of Jesus Christ, not in the closed Bible. And I went to their bookstore. And in the bookstore, I bought some teaching aids for kindergarten. I don't know, you can use them at any level. The 60 character traits of Christ. Now, I would have been hard-pressed to come up with 10. Had they said, Mr. Pratt, can you name the character traits of Christ? Yeah, well, you know. 60. Let me give you a clue. These are all right out of the Bible. And for each character trait, they put down their biblical reference. The open Bible. Trustworthy. Loyal. Helpful. Friendly. Courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, reverent, and 48 more. Just as beautiful as those. These are the 60 character traits of Christ. And so when we say, become a specific Christian, deny all ungodliness, we urge you to identify the character traits of Christ and follow them. What should we do? Notice the books on the desk. McGuffey's Readers and The Making of America. The Making of America was one of the more thrilling experiences I participated in. You'll find my name in the front as one of the researchers. This was a time when my, my, my boss, W. Cleon Skousen, said, go find out everything you can about what Thomas Jefferson meant when he spoke of the laws of nature and of nature's God. What was he talking about? I think he already knew and he just wanted me to find out. So I thought, well, let's see, I'll be back in a couple hours. I'll have that all figured out. The laws of nature and of nature's God was the most enjoyable research assignment I ever went on. Where would you go search out the laws of nature and of nature's God? Well, law school, of course. So I went to the Brigham Young University Law School. And I searched every reference and read it. Took six weeks. The laws of nature's God is the foundation of our system of government. It's the very foundation of a free people. And while I was there at the BYU, at the BYU Law School, other students would come up, and I was there so often, they began to wonder what I was doing, and they would say, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm studying the laws of nature. Oh, you mean oil shale and water resources and timber industry? <laughs> no, no, the laws of nature like Thomas Jefferson spoke about. They did not know what I was talking about. They did not have the slightest understanding of natural law, the foundation of the system that our founding fathers organized, the Constitution of the United States. What should we do? Do not be deceived. Search the knowledge of our forebearers. What should we do? Promote the constitutional standard of liberty upheld by our pioneer forebears. Now that's three suggestions. You can create some more for yourself. Those are three suggestions to meet the challenge that we face. Here we have George Washington. This was a beautiful painting. It is a beautiful painting by Robert Schiller. 
The painting hang, hung, it was, it's been removed from there now, it hung as a part of the bicentennial exhibit in downtown Salt Lake City in 1987. Tens of thousands of people were invited to stand before George Washington and take a pledge. This is the pledge. We, the people of the United States, affirm that we have read or will read our U.S. Constitution and pledge to maintain and promote its standard of liberty for ourselves and our posterity and do hereby attest to this by our signatures. Now on the one in Salt Lake City, on the right they had George Washington's signature. You were standing in front of us, a full-sized oil painting of George Washington handing you the pen. And you were, you were invited to sign. Yes, I pledge that I will uphold. I will read. I will learn. I will prepare to support America in the tradition of our founding fathers. It was a beautiful experience, lovely place. I've still got my card. I signed it in front of George Washington. This is a story of a great American. You know, there's so many stories, and I'm trying to pick out just a few examples to help you get the feel for this exciting land in which we live. When this man was born, his name was Israel Belin. Israel Belin's parents were named Moses and, and Leah. And they lived in Russia. In 1888, they fled from the persecution of the Jews. And they came to America. Shortly after that, Israel's father died. And as many of these good people that come to America, they Americanized their name. And his name became Irving Berlin. Irving Berlin became a great success in American music. In fact, some people say he is American music. He wrote 900 songs, and they've stirred the hearts of millions. One of his great songs was this beautiful prayer, God bless America. He signed the copyrights over to the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts so that they could receive all the benefits from this hymn. And millions of dollars were raised for those two great organizations through the copyright of Irving Berlin's song, God Bless America. And we've asked Doreen Brueger to sing God Bless America. As the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us pledge allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for the land so fair as we raise our voices in a common prayer. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside. I have had the privilege of traveling all over the United States in the past 20 years, meeting with good people in every kind of condition, not every kind, always pleasant. You know, we had chairs to sit on, but I can remember the time we were meeting in the Phoenix Baptist Church, and in the back door walks in Ezra Taft Benson, former Secretary of Agriculture. And with the Baptist minister as our host and an audience like yourselves, we had a wonderful time that afternoon. I can remember other experiences where we went to different parts of the United States, always being treated kindly and generously with love, meeting with people of all walks of life in all the denominations that we would call are the sound religions of America. One of those was in an airport. This was the end of a weeks-long conference. 
I had been there lecturing each evening on American history and our Constitution, the great foundations of a free society. My host was not a member of my faith. We knew that. We loved each other. We could feel a feeling between us. And as we were about ready to depart, we were standing in a busy air terminal. Noise and clinging and banging and microphones and all the din going on. And he looks at me and he says, we'll never meet again. Now to this day, I don't know his name. I don't even know what city it was in. I just know what I felt. When he said, we'll never meet again, would you join me in conversational prayer? Now I say conversational prayer because he wasn't trying to show some act of piety by bowing his head and closing his eyes and saying a prayer. He just started to pray without any sign to any passers-by that they would detect that he was talking to God. He began to speak to Heavenly Father, not like he was in heaven, but like he was there, watching over us and listening to our prayer, to his prayer. I tell you, I said amen at the end. And he prayed for my well-being and the well-being of our nation. And it was a joy to be with this great American. I'd like to say the closing prayer. Invite you to join me, just like right there in the airport. Would you please stand? Let's just stand and join in conversational prayer. Our Heavenly Father is with us. If we'll talk to him, he will reply. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank thee for the, the freedom to assemble. We thank thee for the opportunity to speak our mind and openly discuss the principles of the great land in which we live. We thank thee for the blessings of freedom that we've had for so many generations, for freedom of speech, for our liberty to worship, uh, freedom of religion, and the other blessings of this great nation, the freest land in the history of the world. We recognize that some of our freedoms are being encroached upon, and that some of us, through lack of understanding, are not always able to support the freedom principles because we don't recognize them. And so we pray this evening that thy blessing will be with us, that we will recognize and be able to discern thy will. Thou hast revealed thy great plan of happiness. Help us to find it and follow it. We pray for our loved ones, our, our family that are not here, that we might be an influence for good in their lives that we can carry the message of America to our families and friends and influence them to be specific Christians, to not be deceived, but to learn the truth because the truth will set us free. We know this to be thy doctrine. We pledge ourselves to uphold and defend the principles of freedom, and we do it in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.